Many other problems perhaps can be solved in the same way by taking a commitment to solve them in a long time fashion. It's possible that in the not too distant future, a voyage from Dallas to New York on a commercial airline will seem as regular as a flight from a small planet to its much smaller nearby moon. The first human trips from Earth to another planet will very certainly never be forgotten or lost to history, memory, or fiction. The first men to see the far side of the moon without the aid of optical instruments were the crew of Apollo 8. But there are facts about the Apollo mission that you may not have known, including those about JFK's true motivations and the Soviet Union's covert plan to arrive on the moon simultaneously. The Apollo 11 mission to the moon in the 1960s was a monumental achievement. Yet, why and what about it was so surprising? How did we get so far off track? Come along as we reveal some alarming truths regarding the Apollo 11 astronauts' mission to the far side of the moon. President John F. Kennedy committed the country to doing something we couldn't possibly do when he said in 1961 that the United States would go to the moon. We lacked the necessary gear and supplies, including microgravity food, launch pads, spacesuits, computers, and rockets. Not only did we lack the necessary supplies, but we also lacked the knowledge of what we would require. Nobody in the world had a list, neither did we. In fact, we were so unprepared for the job that we didn't even know how to fly to the moon. We had no idea what flight path to take to get there from here. We had no idea what we would find when we arrived there, as the tiny example of lunar dirt demonstrates. In microgravity, doctors feared that individuals wouldn't be able to think clearly. Mathematicians were concerned that we wouldn't be able to compute how to properly and safely bring together and dock two spacecraft while they were in flight. Kennedy asked Congress on May 25, 1961, to send Americans to the moon before the 1960s were over. But NASA lacked the necessary equipment to do so, including rockets, portable computers, spacesuits, landing craft, and a network of tracking stations that would have allowed Kennedy to communicate with the astronauts as they traveled to the moon. To get us to the moon, 10,000 difficulties had to be resolved. Between May 1961 and July 1969, we faced and overcame each of those difficulties. Hundreds of thousands of scientists, engineers, managers, and manufacturing workers solved a variety of challenges, frequently without knowing whether the puzzle had a satisfactory solution. And as a result, the astronauts and the country were able to fly to the moon. In hindsight, the outcomes are both audacious and puzzling. The Apollo spacecraft ultimately had the world's smallest, fastest, and most maneuverable computer in a single unit at the time. The astronauts could control the ship and navigate the universe with the aid of that computer. However, the astronauts also took paper star charts with them to the moon so they could use a sextant to capture star sightings and double check their computer's navigation. This allowed them to journey to the moon like 18th century explorers on a ship. Women working at specialized looms sewed the computer software together using wire rather than thread. In fact, a startling amount of labor on Apollo was done by hand, including sewing the parachutes by hand and folding them by hand. The heat shield was put to the spacecraft by hand using a fancy caulking gun. NASA officials barred the only three employees in the nation who were trained and certified to fold and pack the Apollo parachutes from ever riding in the same automobile in order to prevent their injuries from occurring all at once. Despite its appearance of advanced technology, we have forgotten just how handcrafted the lunar trip was. The Cold War served as the driving force behind, and the politics supported the 1960s race to the moon. Although it has only been 50 years, not 500, that portion of the story has also gone. The fact that an all-out effort born of savage rivalry ultimately succeeded in uniting the globe in astonishment, joy, and gratitude in a way it had never been joined before and has never been united since is one of the threads of magic running through the Apollo missions. The fact that the Apollo 11 mission took place during a decade of change, tragedy, and conflict in the United States makes it all the more intriguing we forget that the country's lunar ambitions were polarizing in and of themselves. The Reverend Ralph Abernathy led a march of civil rights demonstrators to Cape Kennedy on the night before Apollo 11 took off. 
The narrative of Apollo has parallels and lessons for our day in this way. Even when the objective seems unattainable, and even when the country is divided, a nation that is resolved to do something significant and valuable can do it. Kennedy stated that the Apollo mission would help to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, as well as test the breadth of our spirit. We were going to the moon precisely because doing so was difficult. Apollo 8's rocket engine was switched to point in the direction of flight as it got closer to its destination. As the spaceship went into the shaded area where neither sunlight nor reflected light from Earth was visible, or what the astronauts referred to as the double umbra, Bill Anders would later recall how he first noticed the moon. Their radio communication with Earth was cut off as they circled the far side of the moon. They taped their responses to the distant side. The astronauts later gave viewers a glimpse of their experiences on the moon during their Christmas Eve presentation. The moon is distinct to every one of us, according to Borman. I know that my own impression is that it's a vast, lonely, forbidding type of existence or expanse of nothing, and it certainly would not appear to be a very inviting place to live or work, he said. According to Lovell, the vast loneliness up here at the moon is awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize what you have back there on Earth. The Earth from here is a grand oasis in the big vastness of space. According to Anders, the thing that impressed me the most was the lunar sunrises and sunsets. These in particular bring out the stark nature of the terrain. The moon does, however, have a scent, as was discovered. It doesn't have any air, but it smells. We were aware of a new scent in the air of the cabin that clearly came from all the lunar material that had accumulated on and in our clothes, according to Neil Armstrong. To his Apollo 11 crewmate Buzz Aldrin, it was the scent of wet ashes. Each pair of Apollo astronauts to land on the moon tramped lots of moon dust back into the lunar module. It was deep gray, fine-grained, and extremely clingy. It was noticed by every astronaut who set foot on the moon, and many of them told Mission Control about it. Nearly surprisingly, no one had informed lunar module pilot Jim Irwin about the dust. Harrison Schmidt, the geologist who flew on Apollo 17, the last lunar landing, observed during his second moonwalk, smells like someone's been firing a carbine in here. His Apollo 15 crewmate Dave Scott said, yeah, I think that's the lunar dirt smell, after he pulled off his helmet inside the small lunar module cabin and observed, there's a funny smell in here. Never smelled lunar dirt before, yet we have the majority of it on our person. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration has in fact considered the riddle of moon dust. Thomas Gold, an astronomer at Cornell University, alerted NASA that the dust may be highly chemically reactive because it had been separated from oxygen for such a long time. If too much dust was brought inside the lunar module, it would ignite or even explode when the astronauts repressurized it with air and the dust came into contact with oxygen. Gold, who foresaw the powdery dust that would coat the moon's surface early on, also forewarned NASA that the dust would be so deep that the lunar module and the astronauts themselves might sink into it irretrievably. Armstrong and Aldrin were briefed on the extremely remote possibility that the lunar dust could catch fire, one of the tens of thousands of factors they were keeping in mind as they were traveling to the moon. Aldrin stated, A late July fireworks display on the moon was not something that was advised. They conducted their own test, Armstrong and Aldrin. Armstrong collected some lunar dust into a sample bag and tucked it into a pocket of his spacesuit just seconds after becoming the first person to set foot on the moon. This was done as a backup sample in case the astronauts had to leave without collecting rocks. The two opened the bag once they were back inside the lunar module and spread the lunar soil on the ascent engine. They checked to see if the dirt was beginning to smolder while they repressurized the cabin. If it occurred, Aldrin said, we'd stop pressurization, open the hatch and throw it out. But nothing took place. Armstrong and Aldrin spent one night in the lunar module on the moon's surface, but the dust proved to be so clinging and irritating that, in part to prevent breathing in the dust that was swirling around inside the cabin, they slept in their helmets and gloves. The smell had been eliminated from the samples by the time the moon rocks and dust, a total of 842 pounds from six lunar landings, had returned to Earth. These samples had been exposed to air and moisture in their storage boxes. Nobody has fully ascertained what initially created the stench or why it was so similar to spent gunpowder, which is chemically distinct from moon rock. Pete Conrad, commander of Apollo 12, described the odor as very distinctive. 
I won't forget. Since then, I haven't smelled it again. The moon landing has now entered the mythological world of America. It is such a monumental achievement that the decade-long journey has been condensed into a single event, as if on a summer day in 1969, three men climbed into a rocket, flew to the moon, pulled on their spacesuits, took a few steps, and planted the American flag. However, the enchantment was undoubtedly the result of a tremendous effort that had never been witnessed before. The Manhattan Project, which developed the atomic weapon, employed three times as many people. Kennedy officially announced Apollo in 1961, and that year, NASA invested $1 million in the project. Five years later, NASA was funding Apollo 24 hours a day at a rate of almost $1 million every three hours. According to one urban legend, Americans supported NASA and the space program wholeheartedly and desired to visit the moon. In fact, the space program was pushed forward by two American presidents in a row despite only half of Americans believing it was beneficial. Americans have questioned the need for our mission to the moon given our inability to resolve our issues here on Earth. Meanwhile, on the far side of the moon in 1969, the Apollo 10 crew heard something strange. After losing touch with mission control, Apollo 10 began to pick up an enigmatic radio signal. Since Apollo was on the far side of the moon and nobody on Earth could see or communicate with anything there, this signal could not have originated from the planet. Nevertheless, the eerie noises persisted for approximately an hour until the astronauts made their way to the side of the moon that faced Earth. Because they were afraid they would be grounded for mental health difficulties, the astronauts chose not to report this to mission control. People consequently believed for more than 40 years that the mission had proceeded as planned. Nothing odd about it existed. When the recorded transcripts were declassified, the incident was finally made public. The cause of these noises is still unclear, despite the fact that numerous theories have been proposed to explain this unidentified radio interference. But this incident raised some key queries, the most significant of which was, what's there on the far side of the moon? Every month, as it rounds us, the sun illuminates the moon to varied degrees, giving it the man-in-the-moon smile. However, we are only ever able to see that one hemisphere from Earth due to its orbital characteristics. We are always kept unaware of the far side of the other hemisphere. That's not really accurate, though. We can catch glimpses of small slivers of the far side due to the moon's gentle wobbling in the sky caused by changes in its position in its elliptical, that is, non-circular orbit around Earth. In fact, we can see 59% of the moon's surface from Earth at various times of the year. What lay beyond on the far side of our natural satellite was a mystery, though, until the first moon expeditions flew around it. Why do we always remain in the dark about the other side? Since the beginning of human observation, we have only ever been able to see one side of the moon because it is tidally locked to the Earth, which means that it rotates on its own axis at the same rate that it orbits the planet. As a result, one side of the moon is always facing away from us. However, not all of the moon's far side is completely mysterious to us because, depending on the moon's phase, it may reveal up to 18% of its far side to us, human observers on the surface of the Earth, due to the wobble or vibrations. Is the moon's far side truly dark? Scientists have long studied this fascinating face of the moon that is hidden from our view, which is sometimes referred to as the dark side of the moon. Its widespread moniker is misleading though, as the moon's dark side is not actually dark. We simply don't see it and rarely investigate it. It does not always have to be dark and facing away from the sun. In actuality, the moon experiences day and night like the Earth does, therefore the near and far sides of the moon both receive an equal quantity of sunlight. How does the far side differ from our familiar moon? What we discover on the near and far sides of the moon differ from one another. The far side of the moon typically has a rougher surface, more pronounced or deeper craters, and fewer maria, which are the large, dark patches that can be seen there and are thought to be the remains of once vast magma oceans that were destroyed by violent eruptions. It was once believed that the Earth served as a shield for meteor showers, preventing as many of them from reaching the near side of the Moon and explaining why there were differences in asperities and appearance between the two sides. This notion has now been proven false, though. Instead, the colder and thicker crust on the opposite side accounts for the contrasting appearance of the faces. 
Since there have been a lot more magma eruptions due to the near side's thinner crust, the lava has filled some of the larger craters and smoothed the surface, resulting in the darker maria that has been mentioned. Before the Soviet space spacecraft Luna 3, the third USSR spacecraft to reach the moon, sent the first image of the moon's far side in 1959, not much was known. Following that, Soviet scientists created the first ever map of the moon's far side using these photographs. When Apollo 8 orbited the moon before landing on Earth in 1968, people once more had the chance to see the moon's far side. We had observed and carefully researched the far side of the moon up to 2019, but we had never set foot on it since the moon prevents radio transmissions from Earth. To prevent communication problems, all prior moon missions had always been set down on the near side of the moon. By deploying the relay satellite Kuchao into orbit, the Chinese Space Administration managed to get past this issue. The U-22 lunar rover from the Chang'e 4 probe of the Chinese Space Administration touched down on the far side of the moon, specifically in the von Karman crater, on January 3, 2019, to study the soil composition and temperatures. Unexpectedly, they discovered that it is actually much colder than expected, a phenomenon they attempted to explain through soil composition. We have now technically overcome the communications problem and are able to look into the many intriguing revelations that the far side of the moon might contain for the future of space travel thanks to the capabilities of the Chinese satellite Kuiqiao. Why is the moon's far side significant to us? There are a ton of secrets underneath the moon's far side. For radio telescopes to escape any interference from Earth, it provides a prime site. This can assist humanity in decoding even weak radio communications from distant galaxies that would otherwise be lost due to radio interference from Earth. Even so, one of its more intriguing uses is as a launch pad for expeditions beyond the Moon, as its escape velocity is far lower than the Earth's due to its smaller mass-to-radius ratio. In other words, Despite the fact that the far side of the moon still resembles the face we are all familiar with, its orientation presents a number of chances for enhancing our capacity for space exploration. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.